a slightly different topic from the panel that we just had. Mira GTX is a gene therapy company focused on using AAV. Uh, this just shows you how we set up the company. Rather than particularly focusing on one indication or one organ, our intention was to set up a gene therapy company that had all the different verticals that you need to develop this innovative technology to treat a multitude of different diseases. We have a clinical set of programs, uh, a large number in the eye, which we chose as our first indications because of the small doses, the immune protection in the eye, and, an, and a lot of proof of concept. And for similar reasons, we, we decided to have our second indication in the salivary gland, not as gene replacement, but as changing the functions of cells when uh, their counterparts have been killed in xerostomia. And in developing those clinical programs, we established a platform of vector engineering, which allows us to engineer capsids and promoters and genes, so that for every one of our indications, our vector is expressed in the right cells at the right time and at the right levels for that particular indication. Supporting all of this, we built our own manufacturing facility, which is uh, GMP certified, uh, 29,000 square feet. And in parallel, a process development team have put together a, um, a process which is constantly evolving, but we have our own cell lines. We have planar. That same cell line can be used for planar and bioreactor produ production. So we have very flexible and, and scalable manufacturing. And looking to the future, we've developed a way of controlling uh, gene therapy in a temporal fashion. So we now have switches that we can put into our genes that will allow us to switch them on and off when the genes are needed. So it adds this new element of dosing to gene therapy, which hasn't been available so far. So this is our pipeline, uh, as you can see, uh, to a large extent in the eye, where we have uh, three phase one, two programs, a compassionate use program, and a program starting at the beginning of next year, all in rare eye disease. Xerostomia, we have a phase one program ongoing, and our first neurodegenerative disease, IND, will be next year in ALS, we hope. So we've treated a large number of patients in rare eye diseases in our achromatopsia uh, study. We have um, we've treated all the adults in a dose escalation, five pediatrics, and we'll complete this study by the end of this year. And as you can see, for all of these indications, we have a multitude of different designations and, um, and, and ways of interacting with the FDA and the European agencies, all of whom have been really proactive in dialogue with us. So our ocular franchise um, is interesting because we acquired a company from University College London with the preclinical expertise in IRDs, uh, re gene replacement. But critically, in this particular area of medicine, there is one hospital in the world that sees more patients than anywhere else globally, and that's the Moorfields Eye Hospital. So we have a very close relationship with the Moorfields, as well as a number of great centers in the US. But as a perspective, Mass Eye and Ear, which you may know, is one of the leading centers for rare inherited diseases of the eye in the US, sees 1,300 patients a year. In contrast, the Moorfields sees 15,000. So globally, the Moorfields is really the center of expertise for all rare eye diseases. And we have taken over the Moorfields uh, natural history studies, which uh, gives us not only patients to put into our studies, but we have a detailed understanding of the diseases, as well as the endpoints that we can use to go to the FDA to get each of these indications approved and to actually show that our gene therapies are doing something, which has been very important for us. So our first indication is achromatopsia, a horrible condition, 
people are born blind, essentially, their cones don't work at all. So a baby is diagnosed with achromatopsia for two reasons. One, they can't see in the light, they have no cones. But number two is rather than seeing, they feel pain when they're in light. So a baby is very quickly recognized because if you take them out of a dark room, they squint and cry and they won't stop crying until you put them back in the dark. So this is a long-term disorder. Photoaversion is a serious problem in achromatopsia, as well as obviously blindness, which is um, the number one issue. So we treat this disease with an AAV vector that delivers a copy of the missing gene, CNGB3, to the cones in the back of the eye via subretinal injection. This is an example of a mouse model. A complete lack of function of the CNGB gene results in no electrical response from the cones. We treat with our vector, and you can see on the right-hand side that peak that looks like a mountain is the electrical response from cones, which is recapitulating the normal mouse. And in addition to that, what's shown on the bottom, the left is a little mouse testing whether it can see, can see or not. And if we treat young mice who are actually blind in light because they don't have the CNGB3 gene, we can make these blind mice see to the same level that a normal mouse can see. So this construct is in the clinic now. As I mentioned, we finished our dose escalation. We have completed treatment of the first cohort of pediatrics in whom one expects to see a response rather than adults. And we're now in the high dose pediatric cohort and we expect to have data, starting preliminary data in the middle of next year. Our second indication in the eye is very different. This is a degenerative disease. Uh, it's one of the most common rare eye diseases, which is um, retinitis pigmentosa. We treat X-linked retinitis pigmentosa caused by an eye-specific form of the RPGR gene. And what happens in these patients is they're born capable of seeing, but they lose uh, night vision and then they have tunnel vision and go completely blind. So we have a construct which recapitulates the expression and localization of the RPGR protein. On the left-hand side, those uh, little green dots on the top of the red lines are correctly localized RPGR protein in a mouse retina. This is responsible for the correct localization of the photoreceptor proteins, opsin and rhodopsin, which are shown below, and in the absence of the RPGR protein in the middle set of slides, you can see that you don't get correct localization, and these animals eventually lose vision by the time they're 18 months old. We treat with our construct, you get expression in the right place of RPGR, and you get uh, the correct localization of the other proteins in the eye. And importantly, another thing that we do when we're testing our constructs is we look in organoids, so retinas, grown in a dish from patients who are actually blind because they have a mutation. So on the left-hand side is a normal human retina grown in a dish, and you can see this green staining, polyglutamylation of tubulin. It doesn't really matter what it's called, but that's what it is. It's completely absent in a retina grown from a patient who has RP. That's the middle slide. When we treat with our construct, you get a recapitulation of that green staining, and you can probably see some little pink dots, which are RPGR staining. So this is in another uh, study. In, uh, we completed dose escalation, and we'll be having data from those patients early next year. A third indication is another form of, of uh, degenerative disease called RPE65, where we've optimized and created a more potent vector. In this case, what I'm showing you here is a, an endpoint that we use in lots of our eye studies, which is uh, octopus 900 perimetry, which measures the sensitivity of the retina all across the retina at many different pixels. And what you can see on the bottom is a volumetric measure of the improvement in light sensitivity in the area that we've treated. That's what those little green peaks are. If you look at sensitivity and compare it to baseline, in the treated eye on the right, you see these little mountains, which are improved sensitivity. And in the left, which is the untreated eye, you see a darkening of color, which is a degeneration. 
This is from a uh, treated pediatric patient. On the top are untreated eyes. On the bottom is three months after treatment. In the right eye, you can see a huge amount of increased sensitivity as a result of treatment with our construct. So that's the first three programs we have in the eye. And next, I'm going to introduce you to the salivary gland program, which is very different because it doesn't treat uh, a, a missing gene. Rather, we treat um, a disorder that's very common. It is an orphan disease in that there are 170,000 of these patients. But it's a consequence of being treated and cured of head and neck cancer. So if one is treated with radiation for head and neck cancer, everyone who's treated with radiation loses the ability to produce saliva. But about 30% of those people can never produce saliva again. So they have severe xerostomia, severe loss of saliva. That's two to five years after they've been cured. The reason this happens is because the water conducting cells of their salivary gland are very sensitive to radiation. And in these 30% of patients, they're killed. So there's no way that water can get through that gland and into the mouth. So we do something quite simple, is we inject into the opening of the duct, which opens into the mouth of the parotid gland, um, an AAV construct that contains aquaporin-1, a non-polarized water channel. And when that transfects the remaining cells in the salivary gland in an unpolarized fashion, they become permeable to water, and water flows through those into the duct and into the mouth. And the NIH has conducted a study using a different capsid vector, adenovirus, uh, where they showed that in these patients, you can increase the amount of saliva that's produced. And interestingly, you also improve the visual analog scales, so the subjective, the subjective feeling that the patients have that they have dry mouth, which is very important to the FDA. So we're in a phase one, two study uh, with the NIH, starting an additional study in this indication next year. In neurodegenerative disease, we do not have a clinical program at the moment. However, we approach neurodegenerative diseases in a slightly different way. Again, we don't treat individual mutations, but rather when looking at these diseases, we try and understand what makes the cells that are dying selectively vulnerable to the um, insult that is causing the disease. So in ALS, there's an insult to the body, whether it's genetic or, or or throughout life that results in only one set of cells dying, which is the motor neurons. And over the last 20 years, it's become evident that there is a particular sensitivity of motor neurons to RNA perturbations. So we've discovered that if you overexpress uh, UPF1, which is the first in a group of proteins that drives the garbage machinery for RNA metabolism, you're, you can alleviate the negative impact, the, the cell death that you see, with a number of different ALS mutations, not just one mutation. Uh, this shows uh, the effect of UPF1 in two different ALS models. On the left-hand side, TDP43, which is uh, mislocalized in most ALS patients, actually. And we improve uh, limb strength and escape reflex in a rat model of, UPF, uh, of TDP43. And a very stringent model of ALS on the right-hand side, FUS, when we treat with our gene, you can rescue the death of motor neurons to the same level as in a wild-type mouse. So this is in uh, pre-IND, uh, well, IND-enabling experiments now with an IND later next year. Um, and finally, ah, uh, we have our own manufacturing facility, which is open in London, supporting all of our clinical programs. That's it. 27 seconds left. <laughs>